Thank you, choir. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28. And Lisa, I love that you shared um, uh, that Nancy loves Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Pretty much every time before I get up to preach, I pray through those verses. Um, And I'm going to do that right now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of worshiping you that we've just had. I thank you for these beautiful songs that show that our hope is in Christ. We want to sing our theology. We want to sing the truths of your word that show that our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. Because he is alive, we will live forever with you too. Lord, we thank you that you gave us the faith to believe in Jesus. Lord, if there's anyone here that has never believed in Jesus, may you do that work in their heart today to draw them to Christ. May I be faithful in speaking your word. May I get out of the way. And Lord, I pray, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Lord, we trust in you with all our hearts. We lean not on our own understanding, in all, our, in all our ways, we acknowledge you, our dependence upon you, and we ask you would make our paths straight as a church, as, as a local gathering of the people of God. Lord, make our paths straight. May they be according to your truth. Lord, cleanse us, fill us with your spirit, and speak to us now. In Jesus' beautiful and glorious name, amen. I'm excited about today. Uh, tonight, we have deacon ordination. We have three brand new deacons stepping up. Uh, to lead in our church uh, through service and ministry. That's Taz Smith, Barry Beach, and Ted Bruno. Thank you guys for saying yes to that call of the Lord in your lives. I uh, hope a lot of you will be able to come back tonight and, uh, and join us as we, as we lay hands on and pray over them. We have another ordination coming in a couple of months. Uh, Nathan, our student minister, uh, is going to be ordained to the gospel ministry. He just turned 24. I was a 25-year-old youth pastor when I was ordained a few years ago, um, and uh, I, I remember that as a just a huge moment in my life. So I'm really excited for us to walk through that process with Nathan. We're going to do an ordination council uh, where he, you know, we, we, it's an examination process where we ask about his life, his theology, uh, his, his ministry, his relationship with the Lord. That'll be on November 7th. More information will be coming out, especially to our deacons for that. Um, and then we'll do an ordination in, in here at 6 p.m. on November 14th. You've got to pass the council first, but uh, just, uh, I'm not too worried about you, but just want you to know it's, it's two parts. And we also have several baptisms coming up, including one next week. So God is doing a work. I'm so thankful for the Lord's work. It's, it's all to his glory. And I encourage you, keep inviting people. Keep showing people Jesus in your life throughout the week. Keep talking about Jesus to the people he's put into your life. Keep being so welcoming like you've been Uh, to people who have come to who show up here keep giving keep serving keep growing and let's pray that the Lord does that as we open this passage together Genesis 28 now just like we did with Abraham a couple of times today I'm going to kind of pull from a few parts of Jacob's life and tie them together so that you can see and consider basically the arc of God's work in his life sort of his life and the big picture I'm going to pull parts of chapters 28, 32, and 35 and show you God's grace at work in Jacob's life. And I'm hoping that doing it this way will give you something of a fresh look at the book of Genesis and help you to see the big picture. Now you remember, last week's passage ended uh, on, a, on a difficult note. There was conflict within the family between Jacob and Esau. God's prophecy had come true in that Uh, Jacob, the younger son, would be the leader of the family. Uh, Esau would serve his younger brother. This was unusual in their culture. The Lord had prophesied that it would happen, and it did. However, Jacob's life was threatened by the end of that passage. His own brother Esau says, as soon as my father dies, I'm going to kill my brother. I'm going to get my revenge. So Rebekah decides in that moment to send Jacob away. She's worried about her son. She says, we got to get him. we got to let Esau cool off. We're going to send him away to my brother Laban. That's where, you may remember a few weeks ago, we saw that Abraham sent his servant to this same area, and he brought back Rebekah as a wife for Isaac. So now she's sending her son to, to her, her brother's house in Padan Aram. 
That's the name of that, the town where they live. So Isaac agrees with this. His father agrees, as we'll see at the beginning of our text. Well, while Jacob is on that journey, while he's fleeing, he will spend the night at a place which he will name Bethel. And it's really, it's two Hebrew words, Bethel, which is house of God. And then 20 years later, he will come full circle to that same place. And he will recognize God's faithfulness in his life. And I want you to see those together. That's why I'm pulling these passages together. But first, this moment of crisis. Chapter 28, verse 1. So Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him, and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite girl. Go at once to Badan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. He's going to marry one of his cousins. This has been a common thing in this family. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham so that you may possess the land where you live as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob, do not marry a Canaanite girl. And Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Padan Aram. Esau realized that his father Isaac disapproved of the Canaanite women. So Esau went to Ishmael, that's his cousin. Remember, he's the the, uh, earlier, uh, I'm sorry, that's actually his uncle, uh, uh, earlier son of um, Abraham. Esau went to Ishmael and married, in addition to his other wives, Mahalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of Nebaioth. So he adds a third wife. (laughs) Uh, to his collection of wives. This is not a great thing for Esau to do, but he's trying to make his parents happy and marry someone within the family. So notice a few things here. Number one, clear direction from Isaac to Jacob regarding his marriage. Do not marry a Canaanite girl. Marry one of these daughters uh, of your uncle. Uh, We mentioned last week that Esau had failed to follow this kind of advice. And it was kind of driving the family crazy. But from verse 8, it looks to me like Esau didn't even receive this counsel. It says, uh, it says Esau realized that his father Isaac disapproved of the Canaanite women. So that gives us an answer from something last week that it, didn't look like, it doesn't look like Isaac led his son well in that. But fortunately, with the son whom God has chosen to receive the covenant promises, Jacob, Isaac gives the same direction his father had given to him. Remember, Abraham was very serious Go find a woman, he tells the servant, go find a woman who will help my son walk with the Lord. Not a woman who will pull him away from the Lord. So that's the first thing we see in this passage. Next, in verses 3 and 4, we see the repetition of the covenant blessings. This happens so many times in Genesis as the Lord speaks to the patriarchs and as they speak to each other through the generations, passing on these blessings. Verses 3 and 4, may God bless you. May he make you fruitful and give you many descendants. May you receive the land. So the, again, these promises are being transferred to the next generation. And it will be repeated multiple times times for Jacob. So he leaves his family's home for two main reasons. One, personal safety, because his brother's out to get him. And two, to go find a wife. He goes back to his family there. Traveling was dangerous. We, we, we forget, I think, the, the, the difference between their time and our time. This was a really dangerous trip. There's no GPS. Okay, you have a smartphone to navigate. It'd be very easy to get lost. There's no Chick-fil-A. Why is it when we're traveling on a trip, it always seems like we're traveling back on a Sunday? Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday. I'm still sad about that. There's no Zaxby's. That's my daughter's favorite place. There's no Waffle Houses. And he's alone. So he's at risk of bandits. He's in the wilderness. So there's danger of running out of provisions or being attacked by an animal. But God has not abandoned this man. In fact, God shows up on his journey in a powerful and gracious way. And I point out that it's gracious because remember who Jacob is. Remember how he's been acting. What's his name mean? Deceiver, right? His name means deceiver and he's lived up to it. Nowhere at any point in Jacob's life to this point have we seen him walking faithfully with God in any way, doing anything really good at all. 
except that he's just now listened to his parents. It's kind of the first thing. He listened and did what they said. So this, this is God's grace, what he's about to do. It shows God's grace. Uh, verse 10, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. Now, I have a, a history of chiropractic issues, probably from doing lots of headers and soccer. Um, but uh, I have to have one of those contour pillows. So any, every time I read this verse, I'm always, it like gives me a neck ache just to read it, like, you know, stone for a pillow. Sorry, that was, I digress. Verse 12, and he dreamed a stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky, and God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him, saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I'm the one who's been in covenant relationship with your forefathers, and now I'm speaking to you first time. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Here's the covenant promises. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord, and it's all caps, L-O-R-D, surely Yahweh is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. And there's fear there, too. He's like, Wait, I'm not alone anymore. There's someone here with me, and he's not just another person. It's God. This is the gate of heaven, he says. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel, though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. It's an important moment in his life here. If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord, then Yahweh will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give to you a tenth of all that you give me. So I don't think that we have too many really clear conversion experiences in the Old Testament. We have a lot of those in the New Testament, don't we? All right, you think about Paul and Philippi. He's there with the Philippian jailer. He and Silas are in jail, and there's an earthquake, and the Philippian jailer is about to take his own life because he thinks all the prisoners have escaped. And Paul tells him to stop, and then the Philippian jailer comes in, and remember what he says? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And that's what happens that night. It's a really clear moment, right? He's not a believer. He's a believer. He's walking with God. He's baptized and follows the Lord. Uh, you think of the uh, same book in Acts, the Ethiopian eunuch, right? He's, he's on his chariot. The Lord sends Philip there right with him. He, he doesn't even understand what he's reading in the book of Isaiah. And Philip comes up on the chariot, explains it. He gets it. And he says, there's water. Why not get baptized right now? Right? We have a lot of those in the New Testament where you can see really clearly where someone crosses over from death to life, as the book of John says. There's not a ton of those in the Old Testament. I think part of that has to do with it's Old Covenant, New Covenant. Uh, the gospel's really clear by the time we get to those encounters uh, in the book of Acts and people know what Jesus has done and how they can be saved. But I think this is one of the few really clear conversion moments in the Old Testament. Because Jacob has not, like I said a minute ago, he has not been walking with the Lord. Remember when, uh, when he deceived his father, last week's passage, and Isaac asked him, how'd you get the food so quick? What did he say? Oh, the Lord your God made it happen for me. The Lord your God, not my God. And then God shows up here on his journey and gives him these amazing promises and blessings. And Jacob's response, I think, is, I think we're seeing his moment of saying, I'm going to follow the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac. And now, Jacob, this is his moment of commitment. It's a clear marker. It's an important signpost on his physical journey as he does, you know, sets up the stone and pours oil over it and, over it and renames the place. But it's even more important in his spiritual journey. This is where you see him say, the Lord will be my God. Ruth says the same thing to Naomi, right? Your God will be my God. That's another, I think, kind of clear moment in the Old Testament where someone chooses to follow the Lord. But notice here, 
Who initiates this entire encounter? Does Jacob? Is he seeking the Lord at all? No, he's running from his brother. God, in his grace, in his kindness, reaches out, really reaches down to Jacob. God alone can make a way to himself. We see that in this passage. God alone can make a way to himself. This dream that he has, it's not the result of indigestion. <laughs> it's not the result of sleeping on a really bad pillow. This dream is like others that we will see later in this book. It's communication from God. Direct communication. It's a vision from God in the form of a dream. And, and in this vision, in this dream from the Lord, it says there's a stairway. A lot of your Bibles probably say what most of us grew up hearing this described as a ladder. That's actually a really good literal translation of the word in Hebrew. It actually even can be translated highway. This highway between heaven and earth with angels going up and down. Either way, it's clearly a means of, of communication and relationship back and forth. Right? Angels, what do they serve as in the Bible? They're messengers. That, the word literally can mean messenger. And so they're sharing messages from God. Uh, with Jacob in this case, but it's a sign uh, of his, his speaking to Jacob and also his protection of Jacob. That's what, mess, that's what angels do often in Scripture as well. That's part of relationship with the Lord. Again, initiated by God himself. Notice the language of the text in verse 13. It says, the Lord was standing there beside him. Does that remind you of some of the other stories that we looked at, especially with Abraham, where God was right there with the patriarch? Right? Even speaking face to face, there's one moment where God takes on human form and speaks to Abraham. Abraham's able to feed him. Okay, it, it, this is similar. God is coming close. He's having these close, intimate interactions with Jacob. As we said in those passages, he's condescending to Jacob, getting down on his level. Not, not in a, I don't mean, remember I said in that time, I don't mean condescension in like a patronizing way meaning that he's putting aside really the fullness of his, of, of his uh, privileges as God. He's, he's stepping out of heaven and coming and being on the level with, with the patriarch. There's a very important New Testament verse that I think helps us unlock the meaning of this vision. It's a little bit of a kind of a confusing vision. What's his angels going up and down on a ladder or a stairway? Well, I think there's this verse in the New Testament is a key cross-reference. In this verse, it's in the book of John, Jesus is interacting with Nathanael. Nathanael became one of the disciples. And right before this, uh, Jesus has said to Nathanael, he's called him to follow him, and he says, I saw you today when you were under the fig tree. I think what's happening is Jesus wasn't there, and he's telling, Philip, or he's telling Nathanael, I, I know where you were. He's, he's telling him about supernatural knowledge uh, of what's been going on with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel's really struck by that. And he says, you're the son of God. You're the savior of Israel. That, that one miracle, he responds in faith. Now look what Jesus says. It's on the screen. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, look here, truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I think that's a clear reference to Genesis 28. On purpose. Notice there's no ladder mentioned. Jesus is the ladder. He's the stairway. He's the highway to heaven. The CSB Study Bible writes on John 1 and says this, This statement recalls the story of Jacob in Genesis 28. The greatness of the Son of Man will far surpass the vision of Jacob the patriarch. Son of Man is Jesus. That was his most often used title for himself. Jesus is the new Bethel where God is revealed and the new Israel. Okay, Israel failed in representing God to the world as they should have and Jesus came and did it right. Amen. So heaven is opened here to Jacob but really, that vision is pointing to where access to God is provided for us. A way made to God. Jesus is the ladder, the highway to God the Father. Angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He is the way. He actually described himself in just that phrase. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Only God can make a way to himself. 
In the late 1800s, English Baptist pastor and renowned preacher Charles Spurgeon had an incredible ministry. He spoke to thousands on a weekly basis. He wrote an unbelievable number of books. The guy was prolific. But before he became a Christian, Spurgeon felt the weight, even as a teenager, felt the weight of his own lostness and his separation from God. He knew that he did not have a way back to God, that he couldn't make a way on his own. He writes this about his adolescent years. I was years and years upon the brink of hell. I mean in my own feeling. I was unhappy. I was desponding. I was despairing. I dreamed of hell. My life was full of sorrow and wretchedness, believing that I was lost. He says this despite being brought up in a Christian family. He was christened when he was an infant. He was raised in church. But none of those things removed his guilt before God. Nothing we can do can take care of our shame, can take care of the debt of sin that we owe. And Spurgeon knew that deep in his heart. He was convicted by it. One day when he was 15 years old, he was walking outside and a snowstorm hit and he had to find shelter. He came across what was called a primitive Methodist church there in England and he slipped inside. The normal preacher was not there because of the snowstorm. So one of you all have to be ready if we have another big snowstorm like we did this, this past year. So a lay person was filling in. Apparently this person was not a very good relief pitcher. So in his autobiography, Spurgeon wrote this. He, had, he says, he had not much to say, thank God. <laughs> For that compelled him to keep on repeating his text. So this guy's method, method of preaching was just kind of saying the words in the text over and over again. And there was nothing needed by me at any rate except his text. So his text was Isaiah 45, 22, and says this, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Look unto me, God says. So the preacher, this is what he said. This is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now looking don't take a deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It is just look. Well, a man needn't go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man needn't be worth a thousand pounds a year to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. And then he begins to speak from Jesus' perspective. Look unto me. I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I am hanging on the cross. Look unto me. I'm dead and buried. He's walking through the gospel here. Look unto me. I rise again. Look unto me. I ascend to heaven. Look unto me. I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner. Look unto me. Look unto me. It's actually not bad preaching. Then stopping, here's Spurgeon again, he pointed to where I was sitting under the gallery and he said, that young man there looks very miserable. Aren't you glad I don't do that in here? <laughs> and he shouted, look, look, young man, look now. Then I had this vision, not a vision to my eyes, but to my heart. I saw what a Savior Christ was. Now I can never tell you how it was, but I no sooner saw whom I was to believe than I also understood what it was to believe, and I did believe in one moment. And as the snow fell on my road home from the little house of prayer, I thought every snowflake talked with me and told of the pardon I had found, for I was white as the driven snow through the grace of God. <sighs> Spurgeon had grown up in a religious background. But at this moment, he finally realized that no religious activity can save us. Look with your heart to Christ. Only God can make a way to himself. Only God can be the way to God. That's Jesus. He reached out in grace to Jacob. He provided grace at the cross when Jesus died for our sin and then rose again in victory. He lavished grace on young Charles Spurgeon on that snowy day and then on many others through Spurgeon's preaching of the gospel. And he offers that grace to you. And he wants to offer that grace to our community through you and me. Amen. Next, the blessings the Lord communicates to Jacob show us the special care that he gives to his own. So only God can make a way to himself. But once we're in relationship with him, the care that he provides is amazing. And he unpacks it here. Number two, God watches over his children. That's how I'm summarizing these blessings Listen, it's important to remind us that God is not a distant God. God is not too busy for what you're wrestling with. He's not tired. He's not distracted. 
He's not disengaged. He actively cares for his people. If you've repented of sin and believed in Jesus, he is working all things for your good, like Nathan prayed a few minutes ago. He is watching over you. Now that he is in covenanted relationship with Jacob, look at what God commits to. And I'm about to get very old school Baptist preacher here for a minute. We've got four aspects of God's blessings, and they all start with a P. Letter A, presence. God promises his presence. Verse 13, he says, he's standing right there beside him. I already pointed that out. Verse 15, he says, look, I am with you. That's a major Old Testament marker for God's work in someone's life. We see it in Abraham's, Abraham's life, in Joshua's life, David's life. God was with them. And it's a sign of so many, so many of these other promises and blessings that we see right here. You and I have something better, by the way. God's not just with us. He's in us, right? The Holy Spirit of God indwells every believer. He is with you. He's living in you. He's bringing to mind his own word, helping you apply it, helping you defeat temptation. We have even more than these Old Testament saints had. Letter B, provision. We've already seen this a little bit in last week's text. Because Isaac, when he gave the blessing over Jacob, remember, he said, you will have you know, the produce of the field. You'll have this wealth, these blessings. But at this point, he's now gone. Or he's on the way to a foreign land. Verse 15, when God says, you're going to go and I'm going to bring you back, there's an implication there that he's going to make it, that he's going to be provided for, that he's going to have food and clothing and shelter. Just like Jacob prays in verse 20 when he mentions, if you'll provide me food and clothing, he understands that that's what God is saying. I'm going to provide for you. Let her see protection. Verse 15, it says it this way. I will watch over you. And, and as I said, this is a dangerous journey. And Jacob will go through many dangerous toils and snares, as the song puts it. Amazing grace. God's amazing grace is all over Jacob's life as he protects them. Uh, later when he comes back to Esau, we'll see that in a few weeks. Letter D, finally, God's promises. I keep pointing this out, but we see the covenant blessings passed on throughout the generations. Many of the same promises given to Abraham and Isaac. Verse 13 mentions the land. Verse 14 mentions numerous offspring. Jacob's going to have 12 sons who will become the uh, forefathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. They'll be named after these 12 sons. And the big one, the big one at the end of verse 14 all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. That is a messianic prophecy. Just like we've seen given Abraham. The first time God called Abraham, he gave this exact promise. God does not throw around empty promises. He makes these commitments to Jacob completely out of his own grace. And then he keeps them. And a big reason that I'm going to show, quickly show you a couple of other passages is so that you can see that, so you can see God keep these promises. You can trust in the Lord. Watch, turn over to chapter 32. Much has happened in the, inter, inter, in the intervening chapters, which we will look at in detail in the coming weeks. But summarizing, God has provided for Jacob. He's given him a huge family. He's given him massive amounts of flocks and herds and wealth, and he's protected him through many dangers. And now... After 20 years, he's headed back to meet his brother Esau, not knowing how Esau will receive him, perhaps with violence. But at that moment, the night before he meets Esau, he has an even more dangerous encounter. Chapter 32, verse 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Find out pretty quickly that's no mere man. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. That statement shows that Jacob knows this, this person is in authority over him. He understands it's not just a man. What is your name, the man asked. Not because he didn't know, but because he's about to change it. Jacob deceiver he replied your name will no longer be Jacob he said it will be Israel which sounds like he struggles with God or he wrestles with God it will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed then Jacob asked him please tell me your name this request is 
is denied. <laughs> but he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For I've seen God face to face, he said, yet my life has been spared. He understands who he's been interacting with, and he understands what should have happened as a result of that, but for God's grace and mercy. The sun shone in him as he passed by Penuel. That's a variant spelling, of the, a variant way to say the same name. Limping, catch that, limping because of his hip. That is why still today the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is at the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket at the thigh muscle. This is an amazing text. It's sort of a confusing text. But it's clearly a theophany, meaning an appearance of God in the Old Testament. And Jacob should not have survived. He should be dead, having been this close to God, having literally physically wrestled with God. Now, uh, my, my uh, best man in our wedding, uh, his name is Andre. Andre and I uh, have been through a lot together. We're very, very close still to this day. He's, he's the longest term, you know, closest friend that I've had. We became friends in high school. He's, we're very close. He's been there. We've both been there for, for each other through thick and thin. He helped me at a point where I'd gone through a very difficult breakup. He came and picked me up at college. We went up to where he was at school, University of Florida, and spent a weekend together. He's just one of those faithful friends. We also had a very fierce rivalry in basketball because we grew up, we were just both passionate about the game. We played so much against each other, so we knew each other's game in and out. It was like a chess match, what, how we were going to respond to each other's moves. It was, there was no animosity. It was just a very strong, competitive, friendly, but intense rivalry. Well, Chrissy and I had only been married, I don't know, a year or two. And Andre and I were playing basketball in, in my home church's gym. And uh, this story is my fault, by the way. Uh, I was just very intense. Nathan's seen some of this. Uh, you've got a little streak of that, too. Uh, and so at this one point, I'm guarding Andre, and he's dribbling right here, and I'm right there, and I see kind of an opening, and I literally dive for the ball behind him. Well, he sees me coming. He picks up the ball really quick, passes it away, but I'm now on my belly under him, and he's trying to, trying to clear me. He's jumping, and he makes it, except for his foot, which kicks me in the back of the head, and I bite the floor. And that's why I have two crowns right here <laughs> to this day. My wife was very gracious and patient when I came home and said, don't freak out. <laughs> and, and a lot of money later, then got it fixed. So Andre and I <laughs> have that kind of relationship where we just are right in there together. There's wrestlings, uh, with, but with the depth of relationship and life that comes through going through crazy stories like that and, and difficulties of life and walking through trials. Uh, and there's a depth of friendship that will never go away. I tell that story because I think there's something similar to Jacob's relationship with the Lord here. Even as they wrestle, even as there's competition, there's a depth of relationship that I, I don't know of anyone else in Scripture that has this kind of encounter with God. Not physically. Could God have ended this at the very beginning? A hundred percent, yes. That God has, has limited his own use of his strength in that moment. First of all, to allow Jacob to live. But in God's kindness and as part of an unbelievable gift of relationship and closeness, he spares Jacob's life and withholds his divine power except for one little touch on his hip. And that touch you know, dislocates Jacob's hip and he's He's disabled, but he's still hanging on. He just has that kind of tenacity. And the Israelites, it says at the end of the chapter, that they set apart that place. When they would eat meat, they would not eat that part of the muscle that was attached to the hip socket because in a sense, they regarded it as holy. God had touched that on their forefather. And Jacob was blessed by God. But listen, he left with a limp, didn't he? When God touches you, you don't walk the same way. When God touches your life, you will be marked by it. You will be changed. And people should be able to see the difference. God had reached down into Jacob's life in chapter 28 when he gave him the vision of the ladder. He touched Jacob and he blesses him greatly, as we'll see, for 20 years. And now he's literally touched Jacob 
but graciously withheld the normally fatal results of such an encounter. And he's allowed him the immeasurable privilege of grappling with God himself. But Jacob has been changed. He doesn't walk the same way, physically or otherwise. He doesn't just live for himself like he has in these earlier chapters. He doesn't use deception and stealing as his go-to like he used to. Just like he physically walked differently after this close encounter with God, spiritually he walks differently too. Look at it in Genesis 35 verse 1. God said to Jacob, get up, go to Bethel. Remember that place? Go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. This is the full circle part. He's coming back. So Jacob said to his family and all who were with him, this is important, get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me everywhere I have gone. And they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings. And Jacob hid them under the oak near Shechem. When they set out, set out, a terror from God came over the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. That's from a story that we'll talk about in a few weeks. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is, Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, God of the house of God, the God of this place where I encounter God, because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Deborah, the one who had nursed and raised Rebecca, died and was buried under the oak south of Bethel. So Jacob named it Alan Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Padan Aram, and he blessed him again. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You will no longer be named Jacob, but your name will be Israel. So he repeats what we saw in chapter 32. So, so he named him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, indeed an assembly of nations, will come from you, and kings will descend from you. I will give to you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, and I will give the land to your future descendants. Then God withdrew. Again, that's a sign that he's been very close as he's shared this. Then God withdrew from him at the place where he had spoken to him. Jacob set up a marker at the place where he had spoken to him, a stone marker. He poured a drink offering on it and anointed it with oil. Twenty years later, he does it again. Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. This is where we end up full circle. God called Jacob the deceiver into relationship with himself. And now he purposely sends him back to the place of his conversion, the place of his commitment to the Lord. And he does it to remind Jacob of those promises and how the Lord has kept them. You see lots of evidence of Jacob walking differently. He tells his, his family, which is huge at this point, purge yourselves of foreign gods. At least it really raises a question as to why they had them. I think if you, once we fill in the gap in these chapters, you'll see that it's probably the influence of Laban, his uncle. But he says, get rid of this. He says, purify yourself. Make the worship of God a priority. We're going to Bethel, he says in verse 3. I'm going to build an altar there. So it's a specific act of thanksgiving for God's answer in the midst of his distress as he puts this altar together. By this time, he's already reconciled with Esau. God's protected him through that, through that distress. And he says, God, he has been with me everywhere I have gone. There's your testimony. Won't he do it? Won't God come through? Has he done that for you? Has he been with you everywhere you've gone? That's my testimony. In verse 7, he comes to Bethel. He builds an altar for worship, as we've seen so many times by the patriarchs in Genesis. He names it God of Bethel, the God who opened up the house of God to me. He's still my God, and I return here to worship and praise and thank him. The God who has revealed himself to me here and then kept his word. And, and then re, God reiterates this, this name change that links back to the wrestling encounter in, in chapter 32. And Jacob once more offers an outpouring of worship. The drink offering, the anointing with oil, the naming of the place. Listen, our only hope of a relationship with God is his own unmerited, unearned favor, his own grace given to us. That's why Jesus came. But when you surrender your life to Jesus, when you are touched by God, you don't stay the same. We will know them by their fruits, Jesus says. Just like Jacob, God gave Jacob a new name, the book of Revelation says that he's going to give each of his people a new name. There's a parallel here for us. 
And you know what? Sometimes God touches us in a way that brings pain or even a limp. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about Paul and his thorn in the flesh? God's using that to show his grace and his strength in your weakness. And that process of life change goes on until he takes us home. I saw that powerfully in the story of a man of God that I greatly respected. And I'm going to change his name. Uh, and because this is the name that pastors use, we're going to call him Jim. <laughs> in Jim's life, uh, uh, God's glory was reflected consistently. <clears throat> he was a he lived in a major city. He was a great uh, businessman, widely respected, generous to his church, generous to homeless ministry in the community. He was president of Rotary in this large city. Uh, he just had an incredible Christian testimony. Um, but t- right about the time that Jim was going to retire from his work, he was diagnosed with a really aggressive form of dementia. And so he obviously had to stop working there and uh, go and stay at home and have in-home nursing care. Well, Jim had been a college athlete and had actually continued to play his sport well after college. And so he, physically, he was actually still in pretty good shape. But mentally, this dementia was ravaging his brain. So there's this one day uh, where just through his dementia, through the confusion and the frustration, he had had enough and he just went out the door and he's, he's running quickly, you know, down the sidewalk and the nurse, this lady, uh, she tries to, to chase him and he's still in such good physical shape that she literally cannot catch him. And it's obviously dangerous to him as he's running down the street. And so this nurse has this incredible idea in this moment knowing the kind of man that Jim was, knowing the Christian character that that he had, she she pretended to get hurt and fell down on the sidewalk and cried out, Jim, I need help. And somewhere deep down, past all of the confusion, I think the character of Christ in him shone through And Jim stopped, saw her, thought she was truly in need, and came back and helped her up. And that's how she was able to get him back in the house. Even through all of that, that he was going through in this severe dementia, there was something deep down of this love and compassion and kindness that God had worked in Jim's heart. And that didn't go away. In fact, now that Jim is with Jesus, his sanctification is complete. In God's grace, he had been touched by Jesus and the difference was clear. He did not walk the same way. Have you turned to the grace of God for salvation? Have you trusted in Jesus? And if you have, can people tell? Are you marked by that relationship as Jacob was? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your grace that I need your grace just as much as Jacob did. We all are desperately in need of Jesus as as the only hope of salvation, as our only way back to you. God, I pray that anyone in here who's never trusted in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life would come back to you, God the Father, through Jesus. Lord, thank you for sending him. Thank you, Jesus, for obeying the Father, humbling yourself to the point of death, even death on a cross, the death that we deserved. Thank you for conquering death and Satan and sin through your victorious resurrection. We we exult, we glory in your victory, and we praise you. God, I ask that you would touch hearts today, touch our lives, even as you touched Jacob and left him with a limp, but changed his heart, changed his life. Lord, touch our lives. Even if we go through suffering, Lord, use those moments to draw us closer to you, to make us more like you, so that others will see the difference in us and they, they will be drawn to you as a result. God, we know you're doing a work of sanctification in your people. You're turning deceivers 
and to those who are in relationship with you. Lord, we thank you for that pattern in Jacob's life and David's life and Abraham, so many others in the Bible. Thank you for doing that in Paul's life, even though he persecuted your church. God, there's hope for each of us. We see that in the Bible. We see it through the work of Jesus. Lord, work among us now. Be glorified in our response to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.